presenting this webinar on polycystic kidney disease and pregnancy. So my name is Dr Shilpa J Sadarsan. I'm a kidney specialist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital down here in Adelaide. And um, my area of clinical and research interest is around pregnancy in um, pregnancy and parenthood in men and women who have kidney disease. So that's my core research interest and we're doing a lot of work in this field. Um, I'd really like at the outset to thank um, the team at PKD Australia, um, in particular Charmaine, as well as Robert and Helen, who I know are online with us tonight, for firstly bringing the idea of doing this webinar um, to, um, to me and also for supporting um, this vehicle to get information out to all of you. So um, thank you very much. I love the work that you do. We work together on a number of different things and it, I think it's really fantastic to be able to bring this kind of information out to the community. Um, I'd also like to thank Arandi who has been responsible for setting up the webinar side of things. So um, Dr. Arandi Hewawasam is a postdoctoral research fellow who's working with me in my research team and she's um, helping me lead a lot of the research work that we do around pregnancy and kidney disease and um, she's the one who's been sending you all of the meeting invites and, and um, webinar reminders to actually have this um, up and happening. Um, um, <clears throat> so um, Sorry, technology. Um, a couple of things. Uh, there is a chat um, function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You'll see a little box that says chat and you can um, chat to, um, to myself and to Arandi uh, during the presentation. Um, that's the place where you can pop in questions or if you're having technical difficulties, just let us know. Um, also saying at the outset that we are going to record this webinar. So if you miss something that we've said, or if you didn't quite catch it, or you're coming in late, um, there'll be an opportunity to hear this again later. Um, we're not quite sure exactly where we're going to put it up, but we'll be able to contact you all and let you know where um, the webinar can be found later on. Um, okay. So I just wanted to put up some house rules for today's um, webinar. Um, and this is really just so that we all go into listening to this information with a good understanding of, um, um, of what it means. So I really wanna emphasize that what I'm about to present is general information only. Not everything that I say tonight is going to apply to you, to your particular circumstance. And, um, and there may be specific things around your circumstances that I don't cover tonight. So um, this topic can be quite emotional. Um, it can trigger a lot of feelings and thoughts um, related to your own personal experiences. And we've, we've ha already had people um, contacting us and, and talking about some of those things. So um, just make sure that you're um, well supported as you're listening to this information. If, you're finding that this is an upsetting discussion for you, then you know log out and come back to us again later. Um, there may be questions that come up around this that we can discuss at the, um, towards the end. And really, I want you to be able to take some of the information from tonight and be able to go back and talk to your own kidney care team, your, the specialists, the nurses, the support people that you have in your life, um, just to be able to raise the issue of, um, of parenthood if that's what you want to do. But just remember that um, everybody's different. There's, um, and everyone's going to approach this very personal issue um, differently. So, and, we, and we respect that and we're aware of that. So I thought I'd start off um, with a bit of background information about polycystic kidney disease. Now I'm presuming that um, everybody in the audience is aware of that because that's why they're here, but we also did have a couple of um, people signing up who were interested in, about pregnancy and kidney disease in general. So I thought it would be worthwhile just recapping some of the basics about polycystic kidney disease and what makes this condition special in pregnancy. So we know that it's a genetic disorder that causes cysts to form on the kidney. And what you can see that here in these pictures is that a normal kidney is about 10 to 11 centimetres in size and it has a nice smooth outline. And when you have polycystic kidney disease, um, the kidneys develop these little bubbles or cysts that are filled with fluid. And over time, you start off with just one or two cysts, but over time, people gather more cysts in their kidneys 
and eventually the cysts kind of take over the whole kidney and you get kidney damage. But that takes quite a long time to progress in, in, in general circumstances. So there are two types of kidney disease, um, one called dominant and one called recessive, and that relates to the genetics of it. Um, and really for the purpose of today, we'll be talking about autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease because that's the most common that we're going to see in um, the pregnant population. So autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease is not an uncommon disease. It actually affects, depending on which population you look at, up to one in a thousand um, people. And with, with the better genetic testing that we've got these days and the real attention and focus on polycystic kidney disease, we're probably identifying the condition um, a bit more. There are two genes, the PKD1 and PKD2 genes that are affected and these genes are abnormal. They, they're not that, um, the genes are our, our, um, our coding that tell our body how to work and function. And um, there are over 1500, possibly more variants in the polycystic kidney genes that cause the cysts to form. So it's an inherited disorder, but it's important to remember that up to 10% of people don't actually have a family history with polycystic kidney disease, and that's because the genetic mutation just develops um, in that person. Um, and the other th important thing to remember is that you can get cysts elsewhere, um, particularly in the liver, but also in the pancreas. You can um, have aneurysms in the brain. You can have heart problems. So it's a, it's a systemic disorder that can affect a lot of parts of the body. You can also get polycystic ovaries, um, which, um, which is a common condition anyway, and not always linked to polycystic kidney disease, but you can get ovarian cysts with this condition as well. And I'm not going to go into a lot of the genetics of it, but it's important to just understand with autosomal polycystic kidney disease, it means that um, everybody has two copies of a gene for precisely this reason, so that if, um, if one gene is abnormal, the other one can kind of pick up the slack. But in dominant conditions, you only need to have one gene being abnormal and you can be at risk of the disease. And that's the situation in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Um, when you're having a child, you give your, um, you get, uh, the, the baby gets half of their genes from mum, half of their genes from dad. So a mum has a 50-50 chance of actually passing on the mutation to their offspring. And so there's a 50% chance of um, genetic transmission. And I guess that's one of the key things to remember as we're moving forward. It's also important to remember that um, with polycystic kidney disease, everyone gets cysts. Obviously, if you don't have cysts, you don't have the um, clinical manifestation of the disease. But not everybody gets kidney failure, and that's really important to remember. Um, a lot of patients with polycystic kidney disease will have no renal impairment or will just have um, a few cysts and not progress. And so a lot of the women that we see, um, or I see in my pregnancy counselling clinic, have got polycystic kidney disease um, genetically diagnosed or diagnosed based on a few cysts, but actually otherwise have okay kidney function. It's a condition like with many other kidney diseases where high blood pressure is quite common and it's one of the things that we look out for. And high blood pressure might be the first thing that gets picked up with polycystic kidney disease. And if you are going to get kidney failure, those cysts take a long time to develop. So most of the women who are younger of childbearing age might not have um, significant manifestations of the disease at that stage. But as I said, it's most, some women do, and everyone's different. Um, but a lot of the time we're seeing women who've got early stage polycystic kidney disease when we're coming up to pregnancy. So that's just a bit about that background. And I could say a lot more on the topic of polycystic kidney disease, but um, there are some really great resources that you can find out there to learn more if you're wanting to do so. Obviously, PKD Australia have got fantastic um, information on their website. Um, Kidney Health Australia has got some fact sheets and um, um, other information about generally about kidney disease and taking care of your kidneys and some great um, things to get involved with as well. Um, and then the um, 
uh, Australia has the CARI guidelines, so that's Caring for Australasians with Renal Impairment, and they've got guidelines on the clinical care um, for polycystic kidney disease, including some guidelines that are written for lay people. Um, so you don't have to be um, a scientist or a doctor to be able to understand those guidelines. They've been um, translated into simpler language. So that's a really great set of resources for you to learn a little bit more about polycystic kidney disease if you're not already aware of them, which I'm sure many of you are. So I'm also going to just take a few minutes to go through some of the um, the medical terminology that we talk about when we're talking about pregnancy and kidney disease in general. Now, I'm sure most of you who've, um, who have um, been affected by kidney disease will be aware of this magic magic thing called the creatinine and we're always focused on what's your creatinine, um, what's your kidney function doing. So the creatinine is a marker of kidney function and it, it really is a byproduct of your muscle mass and we use your the creatinine measurement from a blood test to work out your kidney function and that's something called the GFR and I'll talk about that in a minute. It's really important that we understand this because when we come to discussing what effect a pregnancy might have on kidney function or what effect um, kidney function might have on pregnancy, these parameters are really important. Um, and it's important to remember that your creatinine actually normally falls during pregnancy. So what's normal in um, a non-pregnant person could actually be quite abnormal in somebody who's pregnant. So we kind of have to change our reference ranges when we're thinking about pregnancy. So um, for those of you who've been wondering um, what the filtering unit of a kidney looks like, this is actually what it looks like. This is a, um, a very high powered microscope picture of a glomerulus, um, which is otherwise known as the filtering unit. And it's like a little sack of worms and the blood flows through those tubes and gets filtered across that barrier. So, um, and you've got about a, you know, um, normally born with about a million of these in each of your kidney. And this is what gets damaged and destroyed as the cysts grow. And so we talk about the glomerular filtration rate, which is how much filtering this um, filtering unit does. And I kind of like to think about the GFR, or glomerular filtration rate, as a percentage of kidney function. So, um, Normally, it's about 100 to 120 mils per minute. So if you've got a GFR of 25, it means you're down to 25% of your kidney function. And that's really good because it gives us a language with which to talk about kidney disease, which is really helpful as you're monitoring. We also look at protein in the urine or otherwise known as albumin. So albumin's that white stuff around your egg. So every time you have an egg, you're thinking of albumin and there should be none of that in your urine. Um, you, um, and if you do have albumin in the urine, even at small levels, that's a sign of kidney damage. So we focus a lot on protein or albumin in the urine when we're looking for features of kidney damage or um, kidneys getting worse. And then the ultrasound of a kidney is very important as well. So remember I said to you that normally a kidney is about 10 to 11 centimetres in size, nice and smooth. Um, in polycystic kidney disease, the, um, you can see on this ultrasound here, the normal architecture of the kidney has been um, disrupted and that instead you've got these big cysts and you've got, you know, kidneys can be really large in size, as many of you know. Um, and sometimes can take up the whole tummy, which is really important to think about when you're trying to squeeze a baby in there as well. So we take all of this information and we try and give people a label. As doctors seem to love to label people. And we talk about the stages of chronic kidney disease and that's stage one through to five. Stage one is really early disease, um, very, very minor or mild. Um, and it goes all the way through to stage five, which is really advanced kidney failure or people who are on dialysis or have had a transplant. And you'll see as we go on why that stage of kidney disease is, um, um, is really important in, um, in pregnancy. So that's sort of a bit of the background info. And I think armed with that knowledge, we can move forward and now start talking more specifically about parenthood. So um, when I first, um, started to develop a research interest in this area, one of the first things I did was um, uh, 
series of studies where we interviewed women um, in a number of different places around Australia around their experience of, um, of pregnancy and um, when, when they were someone who was living with kidney disease. And that was a, a very enlightening and I think quite important thing to do. No one had ever done that before. We were um, able to get some really important insights and turn that into a framework for how we counsel women about pregnancy. And these are some of the things that women have told us, and this might not be all women, but this was um, some of the key things that came through. That for many women with kidney disease, motherhood and achieving motherhood is a goal and an aspiration for some, you know, for some women, not for everyone, but um, certainly for a lot of the women that we spoke to. Um, and that kidney disease can put a spanner in the works for achieving that goal, and, and this can lead to a sense of, of grief and failure at having that not being able to get there and having these health barriers put in front of you that stop you from getting there. And so this is you know, where this becomes a very sensitive and personal topic. And what women told us was that they had many fears and insecurities about their decision-making. There were so many decisions to be made. Do I, don't I, what does this mean? How do I go about it? They're worried about their own health, worried about their own future, worried about the baby. Um, particularly women with transplants were worried about gambling with the transplant that they know was very precious um, and and so there's all this you know all this going on that really requires a lot of navigation and um, I'm sure many of you have had some of these feelings before but everyone's journey is different. Um, what we also heard absolutely loud and clear from these women that we spoke to was medical judgment, judgment from the medical team, um, doctors saying, no, 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 you mustn't do this, you can't do that, I forbid you to do that, this is gonna be a disaster, was very unhelpful. Um, and that what was helpful was hope and positivity and information and sharing that decision-making, um, even if, the end outcome was that a woman wasn't going to pursue a pregnancy or that they were whatever the outcome that sharing of information and taking that journey together was really important so that that, that was um, an important lesson for us and that's something that we've put into our counseling framework so this is what that counseling framework looks like and it's about the patient at the center of care and of that decision making process um, there's a lot of emphasis on preconception counselling and risk assessment, and I'll be talking a bit about how we do that in a moment. Um, that for women who do want to go ahead and have a pregnancy, that they need to have an individualised management plan. So it's not one size fits all. Um, in women with polycystic kidney disease, there's a very important role for genetic counselling, um, testing, and something called PGD or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And um, this is something I'll talk about um, a little bit later. We need to watch very closely for pregnancy-related complications. We need to follow up very carefully afterwards and think about contraception at all stages and think about the psychosocial impact of all of this process on um, the woman, their partner, their family, um, uh, etc. And if you want to learn a little bit more about this, um, we have recently, just very recently, hot off the press, published a paper um, which is open access and available in the International Journal of Women's Health about pregnancy and polycystic kidney disease. So when I talk to women and when they come to my clinic, um, which I run at the Royal Adelaide, these are the main questions that they really want to know. If I get pregnant, what effect will my kidney disease have on the pregnancy? What effect will the pregnancy have on my kidney function? Um, you know, am I going to, is, is it going to be worse? Am I going to end up on dialysis? Am I hastening, um, you know, a decline in my kidney um, situation? Um, what will be the long-term effect on my baby and particularly around the inheritance of genetic kidney disease is really quite important, but also the medications and um, the, the overall effects of having um, maternal problems in the pregnancy. And, and some of these questions I find actually quite hard to answer because we don't have the data to back it up. So that's what really motivates the research work that we're doing is to try and have really good information so we can answer these questions accurately. And the answers really depend on what stage you are 
with your chronic kidney disease. And that's why I made the point of talking about GFR so that, and talking about the CKD stages. And it depends on the rest of your health. Um, you know, a lot of women just have polycystic kidney disease and nothing else, but others may have diabetes or blood pressure or um, other conditions. It depends on your social um, situation and what your personal perspectives and preferences are. And we know that people have a wide variety of views on pregnancy and um, kidney disease. Um, and it depends on who you've got supporting you, your partners, your family, your friends, your workplace. So like I said, this is um, not a one size fits all. And that's why you need to have tailored plans because no two women are alike. So just a few words about pregnancy and kidneys. Um, pregnancy is actually quite an important stress test for kidneys, even if you don't have kidney disease. So very early on in pregnancy, even you know, within the first trimester, your heart is working harder, you increase your blood volume, so there's more blood flowing around the body, you retain salt and water, and your kidneys work about 50% harder even before some, um, the end of the first trimester. So sometimes even before pregnancy is really diagnosed. And so um, in women with normal kidney function, that's not a problem. The body adapts to these really huge changes. Um, but in women with kidney disease, you can imagine that that, is, that can be quite stressful and can stress out the kidneys. So we, we see the um, pregnancy as a bit of a stress test. And so when we're looking at what might lead to the pregnancy not going as well as, um, um, as you might have if you didn't have kidney disease, which is, you know, um, um, you know, not a situation that you can really have control over, um, these are the things that we look at. And the most important thing is the level of kidney function that you had before you go into the pregnancy. So, you know, we have to think about that EGFR and, and CK, CKD stage. Then if you've got a lot of protein in the urine, there's a sign of kidney damage. If you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, and um, depending on what the cause of your kidney disease is, so polycystic kidney disease is one cause, there may be other causes. Um, so depend, all of those things interact with each other to determine um, how your um, kidney function is going to, um, to go. So just recapping, you know, that these are the stages of kidney disease from one through to five. And um, this heat map kind of like tells us which are the, going to be the worst cases in pregnancy, um, where if you've got lots and lots of protein in the urine and you've got um, a lower GFR, you're probably going to fall a little bit more in the zone of patients that we worry about more in pregnancy. And so this is a little slide that I use when I'm talking to women. And on the, um, on the X axis here, we've got your creatinine or your kidney function or your CKD stage. And then up here is your risk of having what we call an adverse outcome. So the pregnancy not going entirely to plan. And you can see that in the earlier stages of kidney disease, that risk is quite low. But as your kidney failure advances, that risk increases. And obviously women with dialysis and um, a transplant and advanced kidney failure have got the highest risk of a pregnancy not going entirely to plan. So when we think about what might not go to plan, we worry about mum and we worry about baby. And in mum, we're worried about the kidney function going down either temporarily and then recovering or permanently. Um, and being coming out of the pregnancy with worse kidney function than when you went in. We worry about blood pressure and preeclampsia, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And then with the baby, we worry about the baby being lost early on. And we know that, you know, there's miscarriage is common in our um, in women in general, but in particularly in women with more advanced kidney disease, miscarriage is a little bit more common. Um, and we're also worried about the baby being born early, the baby not growing well, all because, you know, the mum's health is, um, is not 100%. So these are the things that we worry about. And we worry more in women who've got worse kidney function. Um, but, but, and this is a really important but, hang on. There is actually a good chance that your pregnancy is going to go well. So when we talk about, oh, there might be a 50% chance that your kidney function goes down, there's actually a 50% chance that it won't go down. So again, this is about how we present this information. It's not all doom and gloom. Um, if we can do careful planning and um, you know, 
uh, make sure that we're not taking too many risks and that we're trying to address things as um, beforehand, there is actually a very good chance of having a good pregnancy outcome. And this is something that we're seeing more and more, um, better pregnancy outcomes um, for women with kidney disease, which is really exciting. So how do we approach management? So I prefer to look more like the person on the on the right, um, but you don't want to be too zen. You don't want to be too relaxed about pregnancy, but you also don't want to be um, freaking out um, and panicking everybody around you um, as well. So we have to find a balance between those two states. And the way we do that is by having a really, really good plan and a really good approach. So this is again from um, just an example of one of the frameworks for clinical care that I've developed. Um, I've got a couple of these going for, for managing women with kidney disease and it looks complicated because it is. It's a lot of work and not all of this will apply to every patient and I'm not going to go through each of these the, the whole al algorithm but it's actually about just actively thinking about what's important in pregnancy and um, um, planning ahead and doing as much planning as possible. So this, this is an example of what happens when you don't plan ahead. So the plan ahead sign, you have kind of been painted into a corner um, because they didn't plan ahead. And that's exactly what we don't want when we're planning for a pregnancy and someone who's got kidney disease, that you, you plan ahead, you stratify according to risks that we know are important and particularly the stage of kidney disease, blood pressure, et cetera. You, um, and then you do some informed decision making around you know what 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 are going to be the risks in this pregnancy what are the things that we need to tidy up before going ahead um, what other information do we need so this is when you talk about genetic counseling um, getting advice from the obstetricians um, doing as much planning ahead as possible and if you can do that then you can um, you know go in with a lot more confidence that, that at least you know what some of the problems that you might come up against are and can then be better in control of them. So the timing of pregnancy is really critical um, you know do you go now do you go early um, do you wait if you wait then does that mean your kidney function is going to be worse so this is an example of um, why these plans need to be individualised based on your circumstances. So this is, you know, a good reminder to talk about pregnancy early with your care team and take the time to plan that pregnancy. What we like to see usually is that women have stable kidney function that's not too advanced, um, that they've got well-controlled blood pressure, that they're on medications that are pregnancy safe. But if you've got advanced kidney disease, that window of opportunity can be tricky. Um, do you wait until you've your kidneys have failed and then you've gotten a transplant and then you usually have to wait for a couple of years after a transplant before you can have a baby. If you do wait, does that mean you've missed your window of opportunity? So that's why I'm really keen for people to talk about this early so that they at least know what the, um, what the processes are. And while you're waiting, it's really important to have good contraception because there's no point in doing all of this and then having an unplanned pregnancy. You can't assume that just because you've got kidney failure, you're not fertile. That's a really important message. And I can tell you right now, kidney specialists are terrible at talking about contraception. So this is where your GP really becomes um, very important. So blood pressure control is really um, key. Many patients with polycystic kidney disease are on um, medications to control their blood pressure, particularly these drugs called ACE inhibitors or angioretentin tensin receptor blockers that we consider those to be first line for kidney disease and they're the drugs that end in either Pril or Sartan so it might be familiar to many of you and we used to think that you had to stop these long before you got pregnant we now recognize that in most women if they're sensible and aren't going to come in with an unplanned pregnancy that they didn't know about but if you're trying to conceive it's okay to take those medications up until you know that you're pregnant and then stop you shouldn't be taking them well into the first trimester or beyond because they can cause kidney problems in the baby. But it's okay to take them right up until the time you get pregnant. That's important because you don't want to be off these medications. These are very important medications to slow down kidney disease. You don't want to be off them for years while you're waiting to get pregnant um, because then you lose the benefit. Um, Many of you will be aware of um, the exciting advances in treatment for polycystic kidney disease with um, 
um, with drugs like tolvaptin. So tolvaptin is now being used in Australia for um, women, uh, for people who've got PKD where the kidney function is going down quite quickly. Um, and it's a way of stabilising kidney function. So if you've got kidney function that's going down quite quickly, you're probably you know, pregnancy may not be the right, it might, might not be the right time for you for a pregnancy. So you need to be considering that carefully anyway. Um, but we know that this drug has been toxic in animal models. We don't have any information about its use in pregnancy. So we have to, gen we have to stop it well ahead of pregnancy. Um, so that's um, something really important to remember if you're thinking about that medication. We've talked a bit about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and now that we have this much broader ability to test for the polycystic kidney disease genes, um, we can actually, um, women can go through an IVF type procedure where the embryo can be tested for the gene, but you have to know what the gene is. So not all cases, um, you'll be able to identify the gene, but if you can, then there is this approach that is possible where you can choose an un affected embryo to have implanted and then um, and then go from there. Now there's a lot of pros and cons about this process. It's not for everyone. I have to say that only um, ha about half of the women that I see with polycystic kidney disease have gone down this route. Half choose not to. It's again a very personal decision. Lots to talk and discuss there but it's important just to know that that is available and is becoming increasingly available around Australia. It used to be very difficult. It's now much more um, easily accessible. So once you've decided that you're going to go ahead and prepare for pregnancy, it's all about optimising the health of the mum around blood pressure and medications. And if you've got urine infections, treat those, um, get on your vitamins early and then have your pregnancy management plan ready. So generally we would recommend that women have access to a multidisciplinary specialised obstetric service. And so for example, I work with a, um, a group of specialised obstetricians and we share the care of women together. And we've now got quite a good experience in looking after women with kidney disease. And most states have got that um, in one form or another. Um, and what we're doing is we're um, setting up systems to monitor the health of mum, baby and of the kidneys. So those three things and then working out when's the best time to have a delivery. So when we're talking about the pregnancy management plan, um, as I said, surveillance of mum, surveillance of baby, and this, this can be really quite intensive. Um, but if you're prepared for it, you know what to expect. And um, um, so you know that this is going to be a really um, carefully watched pregnancy. And what are we watching for? We're watching for a deterioration in kidney function. We're watching for preeclampsia and high blood pressure. I'll talk about those in a minute. We're trying to fix anything that comes up that we can fix, like an infection or if someone gets diabetes in pregnancy, which is quite common in our community. Um, and we're watching the baby and we're trying to work out when is the time to deliver this baby? When, have, when has this pregnancy gone on long enough? So that requires a lot of assessing. And we're talking about blood tests, urine tests and blood pressure. So, and the frequency of this testing depends on your stage of kidney disease and your overall health. But as part of the pregnancy planning, this will be set up in advance that, okay, you know, um, we're gonna be watching you this closely. Some women, you can get away with just checking them once a tri every trimester. Other women, monthly. I've got some women, I'm checking them weekly. So it just depends on what your individual circumstances are. Blood pressure is something we really focus on. We, um, it's easy to do, so you can measure really quite often. And, and often I say to women, have a blood pressure machine at home um, and um, email me your, your BP readings. Um, we know that in pregnancy, we want to have it not too high, but we also don't want to go too low because then you're not getting enough blood flow to the placenta and the baby doesn't grow. So we don't need to overdo it. Um, and some people will need blood pressure medications to start in pregnancy if they're not on them already. And we're watching out for this thing called preeclampsia. And I could give a whole talk on preeclampsia and I won't, but it's just a really important medical problem in pregnancy. In women in the normal population, it occurs in about 2 to 10% of pregnancies. But in um, women with kidney disease, it can be really much more common than that, depending um, even women with early stage kidney disease, the preeclampsia rate can be 20, 
and same for women with transplants. So this is where you get high blood pressure and then abnormal kidney function and protein in the urine, which doesn't sound any different to kidney disease. And in patients with kidney disease, it can actually be a bit hard to pick preeclampsia compared to kidney disease. And sometimes you don't know which is which. Um, it is hard to predict who's going to get preeclampsia. Um, in the general population, um, people have developed various blood tests and ultrasound tests to try and help diagnose it and prevent it, but none of them have really been validated in women with kidney disease. So they don't really quite apply. Um, and usually you can't treat it, you have to deliver the baby. So it's an important thing that we really look out for. The good news is that a simple treatment, um, aspirin, has been shown in women who are at high risk to really reduce the rate of preeclampsia. So we recommend that women go on aspirin um, fairly early um, after the first trimester. Um, and we think it's relatively simple and safe and, um, and, and can be effective. It doesn't completely take away the risk of preeclampsia, but it's at least something that we can do. Um, what we do know is that not enough women with kidney disease actually get put on aspirin. It somehow seems to get forgotten. So we kind of have to remind clinicians that um, the aspirin is really important. Back and tummy pain um, is a problem in polycystic kidney disease anyway. Um, but when you're pregnant and you've already got a tummy that's full of cysts, either from the kidneys or liver, um, the baby, adding a baby in there can really um, um, cramp um, the abdominal cavity even more. Um, sometimes the kidneys and liver um, can stretch in size during pregnancy as all of the muscles relax and um, that can cause pain. Um, and cysts can rupture and bleed and get infected and all of that can cause pain as well. And um, just being pregnant increases your risk of urine infections just in normal women and that's more so in women with polycystic kidney disease. So these are the things that we need to look out for. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other things that cause tummy pain in pregnancy. So that can sometimes be a problem in our patients with PKD. Now there's no reason that you can't have a normal delivery and I've got a picture of the, the stalk here. For those of you who think that that's how it happens, I'm here to tell you that, that it's not. Um, but there's no reason why you can't have a normal delivery when you've got polycystic kidney disease. We don't recommend that you have to have a caesarean section just because you've got kidney disease. We should do caesarean sections or decide about delivery based on what the, what the obstetric reasons are. Um, but, sometimes, but we do see more caesarean sections in women with kidney disease, often because something's happened, mum's blood pressure's gone up quickly or baby's not growing and a decision is made to deliver quickly. And, um, and that increases the rate of having an induction or a caesarean section. The other really important point to make is breastfeeding is absolutely fine. There's no reason not to breastfeed. Most medications that are safe in pregnancy are safe in breastfeeding. Um, and so if that's what you want to do, you shouldn't be discouraged from doing that. So I'm going to just leave it there with some take home messages that um, pregnancy with polycystic kidney disease and indeed with any type of kidney disease can be successful and it is possible with careful planning and care depending on your individual circumstances. And that might, might not be the case for every woman, but certainly something worth thinking about and working through with your care team if that's something that you want to pursue as a goal. Um, it's really important to think about parenthood planning as early as possible so that you're armed with the information that you need to help you make your decisions about your health. Um, and that, that risk assessment of what, what might, might a pregnancy look like for you, that needs to be individualised based on your situation. And really important to remember to keep that contraception happening while you're planning that pregnancy um, so that you don't get any surprises because I think the most dangerous and risky situation <clears throat> is not having a pregnancy with kidney disease or polycystic kidney disease, it's having an unplanned pregnancy where none of those things were put in place. And what I would encourage you to do is don't be afraid to ask questions and keep asking questions until you're getting the answers that are satisfying you about this issue. Information is out there and um, um, a lot of your um, kidney care team will be aware of um, some of um, some of this information. Um, and then we've got PKD Australia, we've got Kidney Health Australia, we've got other places where you can go and find more information um, as well. So I'm going to leave it there and we've got the chat um, box open. 
So um, this is really now your opportunity. I'm very happy to take some questions and um, really just um, uh, answer anything that's come up today um, or anything that you need to have some clarity on. So I'm gonna hand over to you guys and um, very, very happy to hear about your questions coming through on the chat box. Um, so having said all of that, I'm going to now find the chat box. Okay. So I've got a question here now about um, should there be concerns with pregnancy and an enlarged liver due to PKD? Well, as I said, um, <clears throat> a lot of women or people with polycystic kidney disease also have cysts in the liver. And sometimes um, the liver can get quite big. We know that oestrogen actually can make liver cysts grow. And in some women, they can't handle the oral contraceptive pill, for example, um, that if it's got oestrogen in it because it can make liver cysts grow. Um, pregnancy is a very high oestrogen state. It's one of their hormones that um, is, um, really goes up sky high and that's what helps maintain the pregnancy. And so sometimes we do see liver cysts getting bigger in women who've had pregnancies. Should this be a concern? Should that put you off having a pregnancy? I, I think probably not. Um, obviously, if you have a really large liver, you will need to talk um, through what impact that might have on um, your comfort and on the uterus being able to expand within that abdomen. And this is something that does come up when women have got very large cysts, uh, kidneys and liver. To be honest, I haven't seen it too much because most of the women I've looked after are in that, you know, when they're in their 20s, um, the cysts are only just starting to get going, so there's usually room. So I hope that's answered, um, answered the question about the, um, the liver. Um, and we've got another question coming through, and don't be frightened to, to ask your questions. Um, we've got another question coming through about... Um, the use of aspirin and higher risk of bleeding in the cysts. So, um, yes, we um, aspirin is a blood thinner, but we're using very low dose aspirin and we know that it's relatively safe. I think if you've had a lot of problems with um, cysts and bleeding before, that's one of the things that you should talk through with your care team. The uh, the, the role of aspirin in reducing the risk of preeclampsia is modest. It's not the complete answer. So it's not that you have to have aspirin, otherwise you definitely get preeclampsia. Sometimes women who are on, on aspirin can still get preeclampsia. So this is one of the situations where you're weighing up the risks and the benefits depending on your circumstances. Um, we usually would stop the aspirin around the um, third end of the third trimester anyway, so we stop it for delivery. Um, and this is, um, you know, it's just one of those things that if you've never had a bleed in a cyst before and you go on low dose aspirin, you're probably going to be okay. But no one can guarantee um, those, those outcomes and it's, it's balancing up risks versus benefits. Um, we've had another question um, about um, um, about the what happens when you're having your second child after your first um, pregnancy, and do you have you know does multiple pregnancies affect you? And this is a really great question, and it's something that I deal with um, quite a lot. So when I'm assessing a woman um, who's about to have a pregnancy or who's thinking about a pregnancy, one of the first questions I ask is, okay what happened in your last pregnancy because that's very informative if your last pregnancy went really well then chances are your next pregnancy is going to be okay as well not always and the the reason that makes it not always is if you're a bit older if your kidney function's a little bit worse than it was last time um, maybe your blood pressure's not as well controlled or you're needing a bit more medication for your blood pressure or something's changed so i think um it, it does depend on how you went with the last pregnancy and how you ended, you know, what happened. Knee function took a hit in the last pregnancy. You'd be thinking carefully about the next pregnancy and a lot of women will accept that risk and they'll say, look, I don't mind taking a small hit to my kidneys because if it, if it means that I'm going to get a sibling for, um, for my first child, 
Other women will say, no, that's fine. I've had enough and I, I, I wanna, um, don't want to have another hit to my kidneys. Thank you. I'm happy to carry on. And I don't judge either way. Either um, way is, is a personal decision for you and for that family. Having multiple pregnancies in and of itself uh, does not damage the kidneys. Um, you know, so women can have, you know, with normal kidneys can have heaps of pregnancies and there's no clear evidence that really um, upsets things. Um, but I think it really depends on where your kidney function landed. If you can, I've, I've had lots of women who've had two or three pregnancies and their kidney function has been absolutely fine, but they started off with really good kidney function. So that's important. Um, I've got another question about um, having a fistula in your arm. So for those of you who don't know what a fistula is, a fistula is a um, special blood vessel that we create in your arm that by connecting an artery and a vein. And, um, um, and, and that um, that's, gets used for, um, for dialysis. And um, we know that women can successfully have pregnancies with a fistula in their arm. I'm now actually thinking, I'm wondering if this um, person who asked the question is talking about an arteriovenous fistula inside their kidney. Is that, did you want to just quickly answer which type of fistula you meant? The fistula in the arm for dialysis or a fistula inside the kidney? Oh, on the arm, yeah, okay, so I, was, I, I got it right the first time. Um, yeah, so um, in fact, we're actually, um, uh, Randy and I are doing an international study at the moment where we're looking at outcomes of um, women from Canada and the UK and Australia about what happens with their fistulas during pregnancy. And they actually don't do too badly. And it won't increase the chance of getting preeclampsia. The main thing that's linked um, to your preeclampsia risk is your kidney function. Now, women who've had a fistula means that they've got pretty advanced kidney disease. Mostly, um, we would see women with a fistula in pregnancy if they've then had a transplant. Uh, we know that women who've had a transplant have got about a 30% risk of preeclampsia, but it's got nothing to do with the fistula. So I hope that answers, um, answers that question. Um, I'm just having a further look now. Okay, another question. Um, so, um, last week, so this is the question, I'll just read it out for everybody. Last week, Australia celebrated its 40th year of IVF. Do we have any research showing trends in people opting for IVF or surrogacy? Um, I'm presuming in kidney disease, what the policy makers are doing to support people with polycystic kidney disease for IVF procedures. So that's a really great question. I haven't seen any data on the use of IVF in women with kidney disease um, uh, in Australia, and um, but it is something that our research might hopefully uncover. In terms of what happens with access to IVF and surrogacy, at the moment it's a state by state. Um, development. Um, and so some states have got processes for surrogacy um, I uh, and, and people are, uh, are accessing that. Um, and the IVF um, issue and the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is starting to make its way into the public health system. So for example, I can give you the experience in South Australia. We don't have a good pathway at the moment within the public health system to access pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. But um, so you have people have to go to the private system and then try and access some of the rebates and things that, um, that are available to offset the cost. So we're not quite there yet. And I think that discussion is still ongoing. So I don't have great data to back up on, um, on the, any increasing trends. Um, okay. So are there any other further thoughts or questions? Um, just having another look now. Ah, so someone has said, 
um, and I, I always mention this actually, I always mention the fathers and say that we haven't forgotten about them. Someone's asked, not undermining the importance of polycystic kidney disease and pregnancy, I'm eager to get more information on fatherhood and kidney disease. So, and is there any research done in that area? So that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, my husband would tell me that the men are always forgotten. Um, I'm not, um, and I think, you know, that's something that we're very careful um, to try not to do. So we, we know a little bit about men, and, um, men with kidney problems, particularly dialysis and transplant and, and fatherhood, but really not a lot. Um, we, so Randy and I have just um, finished a piece of research around um, the Australian dialysis and transplant population and men who in, um, with, um, with kidney transplants or who are on dialysis who had babies and we had about 1300 babies in Australia ever since we started collecting data on this issue and it looks like those babies do really really well and it doesn't matter if the dad's on dialysis or has had a transplant those babies seem to turn out okay we don't have a huge amount of information on those babies though and we haven't been able to follow them up so I can't give you definite answers there because the information's just not there but we don't think it's a huge problem um, and we're hopefully in a, in, a, in a year or so, we're going to have a little bit more information through some of the other research that we're doing. But it's a really, really good question um, about what impact does, um, um, does kidney disease have on, um, on the babies that are born to men. Um, I've got um, a question here about whether um, successful pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is harder in PKD. And I th my impression is that the success of PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, relates to the um, ability to identify the gene. Um, and so if, if we can identify the gene easily, then it's much more likely to be successful. Um, that's, that's the sort of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis side of things. Now, IVF itself has got lots of factors that determine the success. So it's um, how old the parents are, the quality of the sperm, the quality of the eggs, um, the um, relative fertility, um, and that there's lots of factors that can affect those things, including most likely age, as well as the degree of kidney failure. So we know that as your kidney failure gets worse, whether you're a man or a woman, your fertility goes down. So there's the success of the um, genetic diagnosis, which depends on how easily the gene can be identified and tested for. And then there's the success of the IVF, which has lots of different factors that might not necessarily be related to the polycystic kidney disease. Um, and then we've got another question, does the use of progesterone through the first trimester cause issues for the kidneys? And that's something that we see used in the IVF setting. Um, and as far as I'm aware, it doesn't. The only thing that I get really worried about with IVF is if there's really high doses of estrogen being given, you can get a very rare complication called um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome where women can get quite sick and that can trigger some kidney impairment but generally if you're planning ahead of in time and if you're working with a fertility team that are working closely with the kidney specialists you can come up with a, uh, a, a plan of hormones that's quite safe for the kidney and again this really just underlies the fact you know communication bringing in that multidisciplinary team um, and really um, uh, everyone working together in that planning stage to try and stop any problems, um, preempt any issues, make sure everything's being done safely and carefully. So um, I might just answer the final questions because we're getting towards um, the end of the hour. And the final question is around how much does fertility decrease with decreasing kidney function? And that's a really good question. And it's something that you should think about as you're sort of planning ahead with your, um, with your um, parenthood planning. Um, and I think um, the, the key um, thing to remember is that stage of CKD. So you remember I showed that slide where the risks of a pregnancy go up also your fertility goes down as those CKD stages progress. That's lots of different reasons. Um, a lot of the hormones that affect fertility are actually um, 
um, excreted by the kidney. Um, and so when you've got kidney failure, you often get a buildup of hormones that can stop fertility happening. Um, so that's important to understand. So your hormones get all skewed out of out of whack. Um, getting transplanted actually restores those hormones pretty quickly. So for those women who are up, coming up for a transplant, remember, get your contraception in there because you might suddenly become fertile as soon as your kidney failure is reversed. Um, and the same for men. So, um, so yeah, so women with... Um, with really advanced kidney failure, particularly those on dialysis, are much less fertile. But it's really important to remember that you're not completely infertile and kidney failure is not a contraceptive. Um, we Now that women on dialysis are so well managed, they get really excellent dialysis. They get erythropoietin to bump up their haemoglobin. They get blood pressure control. They get really good dialysis, uh, good and effective dialysis. Um, women can still be fertile, you can still get periods, you can still ovulate when you're on dialysis, So, um, and which means that you can still get pregnant. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it, um, uh, leave it at that. Um, I know that the team at PKD Australia um, will remain engaged um, with all of you um, around any further questions or any follow-up. Um, we're going to try and work towards getting this webinar up um, online somewhere. Um, please stay abreast of the research work that we're doing and Charmaine from um, PKD Australia is, is one of the um, people who's really um, working with us very closely um, um, to bring the patient perspective to the um, uh, to all the research work that Randy and I are doing. So I'd love to keep in, um, in contact and to share with you information as it comes to hand. Thanks to everyone for joining tonight. Thanks to the PKD Australia team for having us and um, let's, um, let's keep getting this information out there um, to women and make sure that you keep asking questions and getting the answers that you need. Thanks very much and good evening, everybody.